Good morning. We've got some announcements this morning. Well, settling. Well, everyone's settling. Um, Club 801 Kids Quizzing starts this Wednesday, and we are doing the Book of Matthew this year, 630, 6.30. We will not be providing a meal this year. We'll have like a snack at the end, but um, no meal this year, so be prepared for that. If you would like to come and help, or if you have a kid that would like to quiz, um, talk to me after church. Ladies Craft Day and Fellowship will happen on September the 23rd, which is a Saturday at 9 a.m. There'll be food, fun, and fellowship together, supplies provided. See Heather Sedlesic for more information. Um, fall Outreach event and Trunk or Treat will be Sunday, October the 29th. So we can start bringing in candy if you'd like to donate that for leftovers. Next week we'll have a sign up for trunks. And we'll actually need a lot of help. Last year we actually saw two people accept Jesus at Trunk or Treat, which is crazy awesome. Um, so I'm just really excited to see what God does this year. And um, so we'll need a lot of hands on deck for that. Um, Holiday Vendor Fair, November the 11th for Consumed Youth. It's a fundraiser. Crisis Pregnancy Center fundraising banquet is on se October the 3rd. RSVP to me by September 5th. We have like three or four more seats available for that. Um, Harani and Marley Brown will be worshiping with us on September the 24th. So make sure you're here for that. They came a couple other times. They were awesome. Deeper Prayer is Thursdays at 6.30 here in the sanctuary. Everyone's welcome. Nursing Home Ministry will be the second Sunday of each month at 2.30 at Spring Hill Village. See Gary Horsley or call him or text if you would like to help with that. Prayer time at the altar, 8.20 Sunday mornings right here at church. So come on, bright and early for that. You're here early, you're praying, you're getting ready for worship, and you can go to Sunday school, have a donut early. There's still donuts here at 8.20. Um, if you get here late, you might not have a donut. Um, new to you, clothing closet. Um, see Sherry Ritchie if you would like some clothes or to drop off some. Senior Saints is September the 7th at 2 in the Family Life Center. See Ender, Brenda or Al Regal for more info on that. And youth group tonight at 5 to 7. And that's it for the announcements. So now, still me, and we'll have the kids come up for Sermon in the Sack. Sermon in the Sack. And we'll give the kids a hand as they come. All right, he's got the sack, so I'm waiting on him. <laughs> so it's really hard to learn something new, isn't it, Harley? And you really had to trust God to help you with that song. What is the verse that you've been... Thanks, buddy. What is the verse that you've been thinking about as you've been getting ready for that song? Um, um, Philippians 4.13. Um, I, can do anything, I can do anything through Christ who gives me strength. That's right. I can do anything through Christ who gives me strength. And that's such a good message, good reminder for us. And so who has something great that's happened this week that you'd like to share? Not related to a video game, a real life thing that's happened this week. Okay. I got my round off back handspring on the air mat. 
awesome round off back hair hand spring on the air mat. And you've been working on that. What about you? Playing with your sister. Who else has something really good that happened this week? Oh, I forgot. I forgot. I forgot. Okay. So we have, what about you, Ethan? You have anything? Something really great? All right. Something that's going to be really exciting coming up this week. Anything? Quizzing. Oh. Quizzing. Yeah, that's really exciting. Who is going to be in quizzing this year? Yes. All right. Just maybe some work on some of the others. All right, so we have a sack here. So what do we need to do first? Okay, who would like to pray for what is ever in this bag? Nobody. All right, dear Jesus, we just thank you for all of your lessons and everything that you have to teach with us. Thank you for what is ever in this bag today. And I just pray that these guys here and those guys out there will learn something about you or from you. Amen. Okay. We have empty Pepsi can and another empty Pepsi can. Okay, so tell us what this is. Nitro Pepsi. Nitro Pepsi. All right, has who has ever had a Nitro Pepsi? You have, oh my goodness. So what is so great about Nitro Pepsi? It's something for grown-ups. Something for grown-ups, okay. What's so great about it? Um, it tastes like vanilla. Tastes like vanilla. What do you like about Nitro Pepsi? It tastes sweeter than a regular Pepsi. Sweeter than a regular Pepsi, okay. Vanilla, draft, cola. Has anyone out here had a Nitro Pepsi? I feel like I'd have a heart attack, probably, with all the caffeine in it. Um... Okay, so is this can full or is this can empty? Empty, I think I already said that. So what did you have to do in order for the can to get empty? Drink it. Okay, and then what happens to you when you drink from whatever's in this can? Mm. Are you thirsty? No. Okay, so you're not thirsty anymore after you drink from whatever's in this can. So there's a story from the Bible. I don't know if you guys remember when there is a lady from a town called Samaria. She is a Samaritan woman. And back then, Samaritans and the Jewish people did not like each other. They were not friends. They did not get along. So it was unusual that there was, that this interaction happened. So Jesus approaches a well where they get something to drink. He was thirsty. He did not pull out nitro Pepsi from this well. It wasn't even invented yet. So he comes up and this lady's there drawing water. So she had to draw water in the middle of the day to um, put in a well to bring back to her home. So they had water to drink. And he asked her, will you draw me some water? And she was kind of surprised that Jesus would ask her to draw this water because one, she's a woman. Men wouldn't have talked to women at that time in that kind of context. And two, she's a Samaritan woman. So she asked him about it, like, why are you asking me to draw you water? So Jesus told her, basically, this is the paraphrase version, that I have a water that I can give you living water. So she said, how do I get more of this living water? So basically, Jesus is our living water, right? He gives us and fills us up with everything that we need all the time. And when she realized that Jesus was the Messiah, she realized he knows stuff about me that nobody else knows. So she ran back to her town and told everyone about the water, I mean about Jesus, and how they could also be filled up with his living water. So she wanted to be filled up with living water, just like we would want to be filled up with Jesus. Probably not filled up so much with cans of nitro Pepsi, but filled up with living water. Keeps on refreshing us. He keeps on filling up with himself. Keeps on teaching us, right? Okay. So that's a message for all of us, too. We can keep getting filled up with Jesus, filled up with the living water. We don't need to fill us up with junk necessarily or caffeine, but fill up with what's going to truly satisfy us. And we're going to be truly satisfied with Jesus. All right. So let's pray. We'll send you guys back to your seats. 
So Jesus, thank you for the message today. Thank you that you can teach us something or remind us something about yourself from a couple of cans of Pepsi. Thank you for these kids, and thank you for just leading them and guiding them towards you. We just love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's give these guys a hand, and they go back to their seats. Okay, and it's still me. <laughs> okay, and this is a part of our worship where we get to give our tithes and our offerings. And I do have a passage to share this morning. Just, it's just amazing to me how much God provides and doesn't really, I mean, he asks for us in return. He asks for us to just lay ourselves down, lay our lives down, our desires down, our wants down for him all the time. And it's so easy to do when you think about what you get in return. What you get in return, not just eternity in heaven someday later, eternity on earth someday now. Um, it's exciting to get to worship a God and honor him and give him back just a little bit of what he's given us because he's just so good. He's so good to provide it for us in the first place. He's so good to provide more than we could ever ask or imagine. He's so good to meet us at our needs when we don't even know we have them. He's so good to help us through difficult times. He's so good to make sure we have what we need even when we think, how am I gonna possibly, how am I gonna possibly share this offering with the Lord? Because I don't have it to give, but he is faithful. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says, remember this, a farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide from your heart how much to give. Don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God, there's a but, but God will generously provide all you need. Then you'll always have everything you need and plenty left over to give to others. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. Lord, I just ask for you to bless this offering this morning. Thank you for what you've already done. We thank you for what you're about to do. And we just know you're moving among us in this place right now. And Lord, just accept our offerings to you today as a form of worship. We just thank you for all that you've done. And just bless the gift and bless the giver this morning. In Jesus' name. You can come. Let's take a few minutes to greet one another this morning.
Good morning. morning. Are you happy to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen? Is anyone out there? <laughs> uh, one? <laughs> hey, let's stand this morning. Um, I want to read from uh, Matthew 7 today. Um, where is your foundation? What is your foundation made of? Uh, we could talk about our house foundation. It's made of concrete, uh, hopefully. Um, but that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about your foundation, not where you live, but you. What are you filling your life up with? That's your foundation. Every experience, every uh, interaction with people, uh, what you pour into yourself, what you watch on TV, all of that is part of your foundation. This morning, Matthew 7, 24 through 27 says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. So this morning, we're going to introduce you to a new song. We want you to think about your foundation this morning, what you're pouring into yourself, and to figure out who is the one that you need to be pouring into yourself to have that firm foundation. And through the chaos, through all the problems, God is the one that can give you that firm foundation this morning. Stand with us as we sing this morning to the God who is so deserving of all of our praise. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down He's faithful through generations So why would he fail now? He won't He won't I've still got joy in chaos I've got peace that makes no sense so I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would he fail now? He won't Declare that this morning. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. He won't. He won't. He won't fail. He won't fail. is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad, and I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me down, he's faithful to He won't fail. 
mine house was built on you and i'm safe with you i'm gonna make it through oh rain came and went blue but my house was built on you and i'm safe with you i'm gonna make it through oh rain sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Yeah. 
about it this morning during prayer time. That's the whole reason we do this. It, it's really good to come together and to see one another and fellowship with one another. But we wouldn't do this as regularly as we do if it wasn't all about him. And so as we come together and we worship the Lord this morning, Let's go to him in prayer this morning. And I do think it would be great if this morning 
and we made that time all about him. Now, granted, there are, there are a lot of things uh, for us to be praying about. Uh, we need to continue to keep uh, Daryl Clinkenbeard in our prayers as he's home, finally, healing. Pray for him and Liz and the family. Continue to pray for uh, Amy King as we prayed for her a few weeks ago. I know she was going to the doctor this week, but I haven't heard anything. Lots and lots and lots of things to be praying about. But this morning as we come together and we, we kind of stay in that heart of worship together, let's go to the Lord in prayer. And let's just tell him how much we love him. How thankful we are for him. As always, uh, these altars are open. Uh, if you would prefer to come and posture yourself before the Lord, those are open and available. Uh, but let's come together, let's pray, and let's tell the Lord how thankful we are this morning. Lord, we do come this morning. Lord, is more than just people who know one another. Lord, we come together this morning as brothers and sisters because of your name. Lord, none of, none of us would be brothers and sisters or heirs to the throne if it wasn't for you. All that we do from this place this morning is all because of you. It is really this morning all about you, Jesus. Lord, when we had no more hope, when we were lost and dead to our sins, you came. And Lord, you had it all. But you, you still sent your one and only son who gave up the glories and the splendor of heaven to come here to save a rebellious people who had sinned against you. Lord, it's like the Bible says, anybody could do such a thing for someone that they, someone that's their friend. But for someone who is at odds with you, someone who has put themselves in a position to be enemies of you, but you still oversee all that. And in your endless love, you said, I'm gonna save my people. And you did just that. Lord, nothing that we have, nothing that, that we have done, Lord, none of it is possible without you. You're more than just a friend to us, Lord. You've, you've truly saved us. And so, Lord, as we come together this morning, Lord, we just, we can't help but pause and take a moment to just say, thank you. We know we don't deserve it, but you didn't do it because we did or did not deserve it. You did it because of your love. Lord, help us to be a model and example of your kind of love. The kind of love that doesn't hold people's faults against them, but rather says, I'm gonna love you anyway. Those people are your people. Help us to see others through your eyes this morning, Lord. Eyes of compassion and kindness and mercy. We want to be those kind of people. Lord, you tell us in your word that the real act of worship, as this song was saying, Lord, it isn't just about a song, so much more than a song, but our real act of worship is to offer ourselves to you in light of all that you've done, to offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice. Lord, you've died for us. Help us to live for you. 
And Lord, whatever happens, whatever comes our way, help us to stand firm and to share the good news with others. Because it's that same good news that saved our lives that will save the lives of others. So help us to be that light, even when the world around us seems so dark, darkness doesn't stand a chance when there's light present. So help us this morning, Lord, and we will continue to praise your name for all that you've done and all that you're gonna do. Lord, you've already done some really great things, but we're hopeful that there's even more great things to come. So be with us this morning, Lord. Lord, as we go into our message this morning, help us to learn from you this morning. You are still our great teacher. And so help us to, to understand more, to learn more this morning so that our relationship with you can grow even closer. We praise your name in this place this morning, Lord, and we hope that your, your name has been glorified in this place. We pray all these things in the awesome name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. Amen. All right, maybe may be seated. Well, good morning, everyone. Hope you all are having a, a great week so far. I've had a pretty good week. I, uh, within these last couple days, I've started to, started to come down with something. I don't know what, what that's all about. Uh, so if I get where I'm all, no, I don't have a fever. <laughs> So if I get where I'm, you know, coughing a little bit, just forgive me. Bear with me this morning. As you all can see, at least hopefully from where you're at, I am not Pastor Denny. <laughs> if you thought so, you might want to maybe make an eye doctor appointment. No, but but Pastor Denny this morning, he and he and Annette decided to take a little trip down there and see his boy and some of them grandbabies. I asked him, I said, isn't this an awful time to make a trip to Florida? They were going like the day the hurricane was making landfall. I thought to myself, man, I probably would have went a different time, I think, if it were me. But I guess when you're from the Florida area, you don't really get all that concerned, I guess, anymore about those things. I don't know. But I'm hoping that you all will join me um, the rest of this week in praying for our pastor. I hope already that you do regularly pray for your pastor. He needs it. I know that most people think that Pastors have it pretty well made, right? I mean, what other job do you get to work one day a week? It's a pretty good gig, I would say. But I do promise you, there is a lot more to his calling. There is a lot more that takes place behind the scenes. I think that, that a lot of us could never even imagine, right? He, I think that there are some instances where he may even protect us from some things that we don't even know. And so let's take some time this week. Uh, let's, let's pray for our pastor. Let's pray for Annette, right? May the, I'm praying this week specifically that the Lord will give them some rest, uh, that the Lord will continue to touch them, uh, but he will speak to them in a fresh way during this time. So. But this morning, even though he's not here, we are going to continue on with our series that we've been making our way through, uh, which is The Essential Jesus. Before Denny left town, he said, hey, you want me to, to send you what the next part of that series uh, was on? And I said, yeah, send that over. And so he did. We've, we've heard several ways so far about how Jesus is 
essential for our lives, but also how some of the things that Jesus experienced along his journey are essential for us. So this week is no different. Uh, This week we're going to discuss about the essential nature of the resurrection of Jesus. Exactly how essential is the resurrection? Would our faith be different if the resurrection never happened? There's been a lot of people throughout history who have claimed that the the resurrection was simply that, that it was just a story. A story that, that was told from long ago. So is the resurrection essential to our faith? Did the resurrection really happen? How many of us here in this place would say that we believe from here this morning that the resurrection is a real historical account and that it actually took place? Good. Good. The truth this morning is I want to talk to you about the resurrection and I want, to, I want us to understand that the resurrection is evidenced by facts. It isn't simply a story that's been passed down. Rather, it is a real historical event that took place. Some would tell us that this is impossible. It's impossible that that actually happened. But as we know, with God, all things are possible. So we know... What we know so far about the resurrection, we know that the tomb was empty. We know that before this happened, that the tomb had been secured. We can tell by looking at the lives of the disciples that the disciples were scared. We can look and see how drastically the lives of the disciples had been affected. And because of this... We now know that the resurrection is essential for our eternal lives, but the resurrection is also essential for our lives now. The resurrection is one of those things about Christianity that people all throughout history have tried to refute and discredit because if somehow someone can show that the resurrection did not happen, Christianity itself would be completely discredited and it would fall apart. Now, to be fair, if you've ever taken time to consider the reality of the resurrection on its face, it seems like something that could be pretty unbelievable. I mean, for example, anyone here ever seen a resurrection? Anyone? I would say some of us would say we've seen a resuscitation but never a resurrection. I've never seen anyone who has died, been dead for a few days, and then all of a sudden, they come back to life. So given that we've never seen a resurrection, how do we know it's real? And even if it is, does it really matter to me? Those are some of the things that we're going to look at. Today we're going to look at some of the facts uh, that support the resurrection. If you would, if you have your Bibles with you, or if you just want to read along up on the screen, we're going to turn over to Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 8. Luke 24, 1 through 8. We're going to read what Luke has recorded. One of the reasons why I wanted to read what Luke recorded is that Luke throughout history has been known as a doctor. We know that Luke was a doctor, but he was also a historian. He took very meticulous notes of things that took place. And while I was looking at that and I was kind of going through, I came across a a pretty cool story from, from long ago. The story was about a guy whose name was Sir William 
Mitchell Ramsey. Okay, this guy was an Oxford educated professor who he doubted the reliability of the New Testament, but he was known for his expertise in historic geography and topography of Asia Minor, okay, over in the area where some of these things took place. So what he did was he made it his life mission to debunk some of these things. Because when he first went over to Asia Minor, some of these cities and different locations were not even named areas yet. And the best known historical evidence of things that took place over there, well, there really wasn't much other than the book of Acts. And so he wanted to go over. He wanted to uh, take a look and he wanted to show that the author of Acts was hope, hopelessly inaccurate since no one could possibly have known the details of that area. So he set out to put the writer of Acts on trial. Trial. We know that the writer of Acts was also Luke, right? He devoted his life to this area and to unearthing ancient cities and documents. And this is what he concluded at the end of all of it. He said, further studies showed that the book of Acts could bear the most minute scrutiny as an authority for the facts of the Aegean world. And that it was written with such judgment, skill, art, and perception of truth as to be a model of historical statement. And he went on to say, I set out to look for truth on the borderland where Greece and Asia meet, and I found it there in the book of Acts. You may press the words of Luke in a degree beyond any other historians, and they stand the, they stand the keenest scrutiny and the hardest treatment. And so, because of the truth that he found from Luke's writings... And the, the accuracy of everything that Luke said is historically accurate. He ended up becoming a believer in Christ. So it was a pretty cool story. I wanted to add it in. Uh, but we're going to go over here to Luke chapter 24, 1 through 8. So let's see what Luke says um, about the details that we can consider. It says, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning... The women took the spices they had prepared and they went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down and their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember, he told you while he was still with you in Galilee, the Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. It's amazing. I think one of the things that I have a hard time with is when I read stories like that, not being... A little bit judgmental anybody else with me on that I seem to think to myself he told you this was gonna happen but yet they're amazed when it happens it said they went to the tomb where Jesus was laid but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus now some would say well big deal the tomb was empty that doesn't prove anything. Some would say perhaps the body was moved or stolen. Well, the fact that the tomb was empty is actually a big deal when we stop to consider the circumstances surrounding Jesus' death. We have to take into account all of the precautions that were taken to make sure that the tomb would not be empty. We see in the passage we just read that Jesus had told people that he would rise again. 
Now, not everyone understood what he was talking about, including the apostles when he said this. But the Jewish leaders didn't want to take any chances concerning this. So look at what it tells us in Matthew 27, 62 through 66. It said the next day, the one after preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, the deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. And this last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb secure as you know how. So they went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. So, to prevent there from being an empty tomb, the tomb was secured. The Jewish leaders wanted to take no chance that anything would happen to Jesus' body. So they had Pilate's authority to take a guard unit and make the tomb as secure as they possibly could. When it talks about a guard, I think we commonly consider that to be um, one person, maybe two, but typically and historically when they talk about this, it's more of a, a unit. So there would have been multiple people. I'm not, it doesn't say specifically how many, uh, but there would have been multiple. But they were there to make sure that the grave would not be empty. Now, certainly they would have made sure the grave was not empty before they sealed it with a Roman seal. So having the tomb secured in such a way makes it impossible that the tomb would have been empty, right? So they put, they put the body in the grave, they roll the stone in front of it, they put a seal on it, and they post a guard unit to guard it so that it could not be empty. It would have made it impossible to be empty. But the fact of the matter is, it was empty. Well, there's some that say that try to argue that the disciples came and stole the body, and that's why the tomb was empty. In fact, this is the story that the Jewish leaders told, and they spread because the fact was that the tomb was empty. So here's how Matthew records the event along with the Jewish leaders. Matthew says, There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Then note down a little further in verse 11, it says, Some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, You are to say, His disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor... We will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers went, took the money, and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. So the question is, why couldn't this have been the way that things actually happened? Why couldn't the disciples have come and stolen the body? Well, there is this there's a problem in the story in explaining the empty tomb because not only was the tomb secured, but we have to look at the fact that the disciples were scared. Meaning, a few days earlier, Jesus' disciples were running scared when Jesus was arrested. Think about the time that Jesus was arrested and all of his disciples, it says that they all fled from him. Mark tells us when speaking of the disciples that everyone deserted him and fled because they were so scared. So to make the argument that a couple days later, 
in the midst of their grief, in the midst of their faithlessness and their fear, that these same disciples gathered enough courage to go to the tomb, ready to take on an armed Roman guard unit, but thankfully found them asleep so that they could sneak up to the tomb and break a Roman seal, which by the way is punishable by death, then steal the body and escape unnoticed by the Roman guard stretches the bounds of belief. That sounds like a like a Mission Impossible movie. You know what I mean? Well, maybe the whole story about the guard and the seal are made up by Christians to support their story of the resurrection. Well, if that were the case, we would expect to find the Jews refuting the claim of the resurrection, not with a story of a Roman guard falling asleep, but with the truth that, was ne that there was never a guard even posted. But that's not what we find. We find stories of grave robbers and guards sleeping. These stories just don't support the facts of the situation. If the tomb were really empty, by some reason other than the resurrection, the truth would be the best argument against it. But the fact that precautions were taken to seal the tomb and the fact that the disciples were scared at Jesus' arrest just a few days before and the fact that Jesus himself said that he would rise from the dead shows that the fact of the empty tomb lends support to some supernatural event that is not easily explained by human wisdom and understanding. But not only is the resurrection supported by those things, I would say it is also supported by how drastically the lives of the disciples were changed after this moment. So after Jesus dies and he's put in the tomb, and the disciples gather together and they're in a room and they're all still scared and they're talking about what are we going to do next? What happens now? Jesus, who we've been with for all these years, is now gone. Now what are we supposed to do? We see people today who endure torture and death for things that they believe for things that they believe. You guys remember from a few years ago, there was a story about, um, there was a guy, his name was Pastor Saeed Abendini. He was an Iranian American pastor who had converted to Christianity. And the Iranians captured him and put him in prison and they tortured him for years. He suffered in jail and separated from his family because of his beliefs. We even see non-Christian people who are willing to die for their beliefs, but the difference between people who believe today and the disciples is this. The disciples knew 100% for sure what they were saying was either true or false. They knew for sure, right? We place, we place our faith in Jesus based on on the word of God and all of those, those folks saw it and they would have known 100% for sure what they were saying. It wasn't just a belief for them, but something they knew. Listen to what the apostle John tells us about seeing Christ. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, we have seen it, and we testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim to you that what we have seen and heard. Listen, people are not willing to face torture 
and persecution for what they know to be a lie. They're just not. In fact, we know that people will lie in order to be, in order to avoid persecution or torture. These disciples knew what they were saying to be true, and they knew that eternal life that Jesus offered was very real. These disciples were changed, and the only explanation is that they saw that they, what they claimed to have saw. The evidence supports the reality of the resurrection. There was an empty tomb. The tomb was sealed and guarded. And it affected the lives of the disciples, going from fearful followers to faithful leaders, willing to suffer and die for what they knew to be true, which gave them hope and reassurance of eternal life. In fact, we know that each and every one of those disciples in one way, shape, or form was martyred for their beliefs. It's because they knew that the information that they had and the things that they've told us through these books of the Bible were 100%, without a doubt, true. So with that being said, the question is, does it really matter for you and me today? Does it matter? It does. Because the fact of the matter is without the resurrection, there is no hope of eternal life. This is how Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 through 19. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all men. If there is no resurrection, there is no eternal life. But if the resurrection is real, as I really believe that the evidence indicates, then there is an eternal life after we die physically. And there is hope that we can live that eternity in a complete, restored relationship with our God the Father. The resurrection proves that Jesus is who he says he is, God in the flesh. And that there is an eternal life. The Bible tells us that it is destined for man to die once and then face judgment. Once we die, once we close our eyes to this world, we no longer have an opportunity. It is only in this life we have the opportunity to trust in Jesus so we can experience the resurrection to eternal glory. The resurrection is essential for our eternal lives. But it is also essential for our lives right now. 1 Peter 1.3 says, In his great mercy he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We are spiritually reborn in the moment that we believe and receive Christ as our Savior. Man, Sometimes, I sometimes feel, we often talk about how this is the good news. And I often feel like for someone like me, see, I don't, I don't necessarily know everyone else's story in this room, but I know mine and I know it pretty well. So I sometimes wonder if I, if I even maybe consider it to be more of good news than some others do, because I know exactly how awful of a person I've been at moments in my life. Sometimes put myself in Paul's shoes and think, I've got to be the worst one. 
I've got to be the worst one. But the moment that we receive Christ and accept him as our Savior, we are born again into a new creation. So that old me, that old version of me who did all of these things that I really don't even want to talk about, it's not me anymore. I've still been given the memory of those things in that past life. However, that's not me now. In fact, sometimes I can still, to this day, run into some people that I knew from before who are just like, there's no way. There's no way that somebody lets you be a pastor somewhere. There ain't no way. I just have to say, well, they didn't know me then. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life and have life to the full. I'm sure that there are many here who would acknowledge that this full life, he said he came so that we would have a full life, it can be a little bit elusive. Problem is, is that oftentimes we look for the full life in the places that others tell us that we should look for it to find it. We look for it in the, the new clothes or the new car or the new house. We look for it in the beautiful wife or the handsome husband. In making a lot of money or having a fulfilling career. We look for it in vacations in physical pleasure, or giving over to our addictions, giving them free reign. The problem is, is that every one of us who has ever tried to pursue those things knows that no matter how much we pursue any of them, they always leave us just a little bit short and pursuing after a little more. And then sometimes we get to that little more and we think, well, this isn't quite enough. I need to go and go after a little more. Problem is we're trying to fill fill a God-sized hole with a man-sized solution. And we are going to always, always come up short. But God offers us the full and eternal life as we put our hope in and trust in God. Jesus Christ, believing in his death and his resurrection for the forgiveness of our sins. Our only hope for salvation in life, both eternally and presently, is putting our hope in and receiving the resurrected Jesus Christ, the one who really did die for our sins. And the one who really did resurrect from the dead for our eternal life. So if you would, would you stand with me this morning? Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me this morning? If you are here today and you don't ever remember making a conscious decision to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Good news is you can do that today. In fact, because I love each and every one of you so much, I would urge you to do so today. We are not guaranteed the next moment. And once you do, you can have the assurance of eternal life and begin to live the full life. The Bible tells us this, and it puts it simply in Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus resurrected and he wants 
to give you and me life eternal and life now. If you believe that he died for you and resurrected from the dead, all we have to do is turn and confess our belief and begin really living life. Now there's others of us here today that would say, I've really been hunting after this full life. Some of us would say that in that hunt, we've fallen astray. We've gone away from the things that we know to be true. Some of the best news I know about Jesus Christ is that as long as there are still breath in our lungs, there are still time to change. You see, God hasn't gone anywhere. I know from a period of time in my life when I walked away from God for a few years, that when he began calling me back to himself, I recognized that he never went anywhere. It was me that had walked away. I went and did what I wanted to do. He was still there, lovingly waiting and drawing me back to himself. If if that would be you this morning, I would like to encourage you by letting you know that he's still there. He still loves you and he's still waiting. Maybe in that quest for the full life, you haven't necessarily walked away, but you've allowed yourself to dabble in some things you shouldn't be. And you know you shouldn't be. God makes it known to you that you shouldn't be. There is no limit with God to his forgiveness of our sins. He's ready and willing and able. And so if that's you this morning, there's hope there as well. But if there's others that just say, I've just been in pursuit of this full life and I just haven't quite found what I think I need. I would also like to pray for those this morning that God will make it abundantly clear what that looks like. He never promised us that we'd have everything we wanted in this life or that it was always going to be easy. In fact, he told us quite clearly the opposite. Sometimes it's going to be hard, but what he promised is that he would never leave our side and he would be there with us. And I feel as though through my testimony, I can attest to that fact. He's been so good to me. So this morning, let us pray. And if one of those were you and you need to be prayed for, I would encourage you either come here with these altars so that we can pray with you. Or at the very least, turn to your neighbor and ask them to pray with you. Man, my encouragement would be Please don't allow, don't let your pride let you leave this place today unsure. Life is fragile, ladies and gentlemen. It is so fragile and we don't know what the next moment holds, but I'm hoping that we can all leave this place today knowing that what Jesus told us was true is true and that we we allow him to be the lead of our lives. Lord, we come together this morning. We've prayed already this morning, Lord, how thankful we are and about how good we know you to be. But Lord, it's so good to look into your word and and to know that it isn't what some of those other people say, that it's just some collection of good stories. It isn't that, Lord. The things that you've told us, we can look at and know to be true. 
And because we know what you have told us is true, Lord, we can place our faith in you and we can lean on you. We can build our lives upon you as our firm foundation. There's no better place to build our lives. As we read in scripture, Lord, you've come to give us that full life. And so for Lord, Lord, those that are here today that are in search of that full life, Lord, help us to, to know and understand what you mean. Lord, help us to be able to take a look inwardly and see just how good you've been to us. We're a very, very blessed people. And so Lord, help us to see that. Help us to see what you mean for each of us. Or do you have different plans for each of us? So help us to know what you would, what you're saying for us specifically. Lord, for those who, have, who would say that in pursuit of those things, they've fallen away. Lord, I pray that you would touch those folks. So that, that really speaks to me, Lord. I know that you know my story, Lord. But there was some time that I left and walked away from you. You never left me because you're good and you're faithful, even when I'm not. And so Lord, help others who are in those situations to know that A, they're loved, but B, you're still right here and you're still loving and you're still good and you just want them to come back into right relationship with you. And Lord, for anyone who doesn't know you this morning, Lord, help them to reach out, to recognize that they, just like the rest of us here, need you as a savior. This life is short. You've told us it's like a mist. That we're here one moment and we're gone the next. In the grand scheme of eternity, Lord, our lives are very brief. And so help us to not leave this place unassure of where we stand with you because we know that you can be trusted and that you are so, so good. And so Lord, from here, we love you. We praise your name this morning. And Lord, we look forward to the opportunities you are going to give us in the coming weeks to share your good news with those who don't know you. God, we love you and we're thankful for you. We pray all these things in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. Amen. Folks, God is good. And all the time. He sure is. I hope you guys have a great week this week. Um, I hope you guys find some rest. I hope, I hope everybody has a day off tomorrow. I'm sure there's some that that don't and are looking at me like, yeah, thanks for reminding me. Have a great week. Love you all. See you soon.